Hello and welcome. Here we are in lecture 20. So as you can see from the title today, we'll be talking about open source project development. More generally, today is a collection of skills I hope you'll find useful, not only for your project which you're working on right now, but for your continuing uh, in your careers. So if you remember when we last spoke, uh, we had a lecture kind of on this on miscellaneous details and chisel we hadn't covered previously. And in the last two class meetings we used for uh, group meetings to discuss things about your projects. And now here we are coming back to having lectures again. In particular, uh, today we'll talk about a set of variety of skills that we hope will find useful for your project and beyond. Uh, perhaps you may be familiar with some of these, but I doubt anyone's familiar with all of them. So it'll be good to kind of be aware of what's out there. So before we do that, let's first maybe perhaps ask ourselves what we think of when we think of the, the ideal code. Like what's the best project? What's the best code to work with, right? So number one, you want it to be correct, right? You, you want to do the right thing. And, uh, you know, sometimes maybe you have a program you are code you're dealing with where, uh, you know, certain input co combinations are not allowed or it's an improper input. If that's the case, uh, it's important that, um, sorry, someone is uh, not on mute. Give me a moment. Um, uh, it's important that, you know, your program flag that and make that clear. Um, but it's not just a matter about the code being correct. It's also a matter of convincing uh, you, the person considering this code, uh, that is correct, right? Um, there's kind of another level of detail, right? It's not just that it's right, it's that actually you convince yourself, either as a developer or as a user, that it's correct, right? It's another kind of level. Um, when it comes to looking at the code itself, right? You want to say, oh, it's, you know, easy to read or easy to understand, it's well documented, but we can create about that, you know? What makes it easy to read? What makes it uh, clear, right? What makes it uh, easy to work with? Um, I kind of think about that. Then, of course, there's kind of efficiency metrics, right? And so, for example, in this course, we talked about PPA or power performance area, but more generally, you talk about somebody says, you know, is it efficient? And when we say is it efficient, we're basically saying um, when it uses resources, particularly in the case of hardware, maybe power performance in the area, is there much room to really uh, improve on those metrics, right? Maybe, you know, some things just inherently are very expensive. Um, but, you know, when we say something's efficient or inefficient, when we say it's inefficient, we're kind of implying, you know what, that this could be done better. And we have some sense of how that could be done. If we have no idea to make it better, we're, you know, as, uh, you know, efficient with area performance and power as anything else anybody knows about, then arguably we are efficient, right? But still that kind of matters. Um, but you can see this is pretty aspirational on this list, right? And getting all of these things uh, in your code and your project on the first version is nearly impossible, right? But fortunately, in this course of our agile process, we've been talking about how to go about um, getting there incrementally, right? We get something working, we close that loop, and then we keep incrementally revising and improving, right? And so that's what today's gonna be about. Today's gonna be about a variety of tools and techniques you can use to continue to keep improving your project, making it better, not just make it better, but also convince other people it's good. So uh, making that more concrete, uh, the specific things we're talking about today are a variety of tools or techniques, right? So one of them is continuous integration. That's kind of a way of doing automated testing. Code management, documentation, and then to close this out, talk a little bit about uh, open source licensing, which is something that I think maybe is worth kind of giving a brief primer on. Um, so, you know, we don't need to worry about loading in the library today because uh, there's no uh, code in these slides. I have some other windows open with some examples from the real world. Um, so let's start off with continuous integration. So uh, when you're developing a project, right, there's all sorts of things that come up, right? And, you know, when you're still focused on getting your current, you know, component or block right, you may not think about the big picture, right? You may overlook how you change this little piece right here and that has a bug someplace else. Or even if you're only worried about getting your little piece right, um, are you sure it's right from like every possible angle, context, you know, instantiation, situation, et cetera, right? And so uh, bugs happen, right? And so rather than saying write perfect code, nobody can do it the first time. We're gonna do everything we can to um, find them quickly and continue to improve and continue to find them and continue to deal with them, right? Um, and so one of the solutions to this is something called continuous integration. And I'm kind of loosely defining this course is just, you know, basically using some shared resources to run tests more automatically. There's all sorts of, you know, various flavors or, or wrinkles to it, but 
the idea is, you know, you have tests for your project and rather than you explicitly running tests, you know, right now locally in your machine because you want to test something, instead perhaps you run these tests uh, elsewhere on another server, perhaps even in the cloud, and you want to check some stuff. So, for example, it's easy to set up continuous integration, or CI for short, to automatically run these tests every time someone uh, pushes a commit to the main shared repository. Or, for example, if somebody opens a pull request, as you know, a contribution from the outside, uh, it can run tests against us. So you can know, uh, is that even make sense looking at any further? Or perhaps if it fails those tests, maybe you don't want to even waste your time looking at that code. Um, and so the whole point of this integration is to make it very easy to run tests, right? And by running tests a lot and having a lot of tests, the goal is to catch bugs earlier because bugs are inevitable. And when it comes time to dealing with them, you'd rather have a bug that's, you know, identified early and very localized, you know exactly where it is, as opposed to, you know, having reports from users that, hmm, sometimes this breaks under some conditions, I'm not sure where or how, right? That's, that's not the situation you want to be in. It's hard to reproduce those issues. <laughs> and even if you do have those errors, you know, actually trying to debug and track it down is tons of effort, right? And instead, let's put the tools to work, right? Make them do the work. Um, and so uh, that's kind of the whole goal, right? And so having TI, see, I can really help, right? It's not only to help you get your internal development going well, you can check each other's code, check your own code, check things uh, more extensively than perhaps you would check locally. Um, but it also helps other people, right? Um, so uh, if I'm considering looking at code or using code, I may be curious, well, what are their testing practices? How much are they testing? Is this something I can trust? Um, so having your CI not just there, but actually publicly visible so I can see what you're doing is a real strong vote of confidence, right? So I can only see your tests. I can actually see you're running regularly and see your ability to address those issues, right? As I said, you know, if someone you have an open source repository and someone's sending code back to you, you can lose this to kind of screen those things. You know, does this make sense? Or, oh my gosh, they broke the build right away. It doesn't even compile. You know, this is a sign that maybe I should not evaluate this as strictly. Or sorry, not consider this as well. Um, or there's other types of code interactions, right? You may make them have a project out there and you may be a consumer of some other project and uh, they, you know, care about supporting you and they want to know, hey, if they make some changes, will they break you, right? And they be able to kind of chess those scenarios Having you know pervasive accessible testing with continuous integration can really help with this. Um, so let's take a set this up. Really, it's just three things, right? Number one, you need tests, and as we covered already, you should have tests already. This entire course, kind of interacting with Chisel, um, it's kind of already been very much test driven, right? Where you know our modules are nice, we know how to generate Verilog from them, but that's just Verilog, right? Actually see it do stuff, we actually do need to kind of exercise it. So you're already kind of writing some tests, but go the extra distance to make those tests, you know, really useful to really check all scenarios rather than just kind of stepping through one, you know, proof of concept kind of case. And what's nice about CI is they add just additional value to your test, right? You already have these tests. And with CI, you're just kind of getting additional, you know, gravy, initial benefit from them. Um, you may have a situation where, you know, ask yourself, uh, with this automated CI, uh, if something passes the CI, how much do I trust that? Uh, if something, if you're not super confident that's, you know, super rock solid, that may be a suggestion that perhaps you don't have full confidence in your test, which is perhaps a good thing to have a good amount of skepticism. So what would it take to overcome some of that, right? Could you perhaps have more tests, increase your test coverage, etc., right? But number one thing you need for CI, of course, is need dev tests, and you should have these anyways, so this isn't so much uh, a new requirement. The next two are the actual things you need to really do for CI. So one is you need some sort of scripting and automation to actually do this, right? Um, there's all sorts of tools to kind of automate this process, but at the end of the day, you do need to have these tests. You need to kind of identify the tests, group them together in the suites, and you know set the whole thing up, right? I want to run these tests on these server, right? And, and the server, right? Whatever. And this, this takes, I would say, the most effort for setting up CI. Um, it's still not that much, right? The benefits. Uh, will way outweigh the costs, even for something like this three-week project you're doing for this course. Um, and then lastly, of course, uh, you need some place to run your tests. Uh, and uh, you can run them, of course, locally uh, on your current box. You could run them on maybe a shared server your institution, or you can just run them in the cloud. Um, in this modern era of, you know, pervasive cloud resources that are free for public things, for publicly accessible things, 
Uh, it's a good time, right? So historically, your services like, you know, Travis, um, which we used to do is great. They've unfortunately been less uh, generous with their free allotments. However, other services like CircleCI are quite good or even more convenient for us in this class. There are GitHub Actions, which are uh, already available on GitHub and can do amazing things for free. And so I put execution in environment as last only because a lot of times people can't think of that first. Oh, I need a test server. Oh, it's so hard to get a test server. And the answer is, no, no. Right now, the cloud is really easy to get this. You can get it for free very often for public code. Um, and it's like the least important detail, right? The most important thing is number one, the test. You need to have something you're actually getting from the CI. Then you got to write some scripts to kind of do this. And then finally, you get the uh, place to run it. And so, for example, in this course, I would recommend just doing a GitHub action. That's, you know, it's a little something you can add onto your repo and you're done. Um, okay, so what are you actually doing with these tests? Uh, there's all sorts of tests you can run. And you may have found already when you're kind of developing your stuff, for example, for even in the homeworks, you may find yourself in situations where uh, when you're working on a certain problem, you only want to run like one test in isolation. Or maybe you comment out tests or you use the test only feature in SBT or something. Um, however, uh, there's all sorts of other tests you can do. And when you're doing act, you know, interactive development, you, is a, the, you may be reluctant to have tests take too long. However, it doesn't mean you shouldn't have extensive tests, right? So what's nice about CI is you can kind of can push that work to the server, make the tools do the work, and they can run the more extensive, more exhaustive tests. And it's running in the background. So that time period you're spending, you know, thinking about your design, staring at code, debugging stuff, tools are working for you, right? So putting servers, running more tests, and running more exhaustive tests, that's arguably very good use of resources, right? Um, and so there's different types of tests you can run. And depending on what situation triggers the CI uh, to be run, you may use different types of tests, right? You may run lighter weight tests per commit. You may run more heavyweight tests for like a pull request if someone's gonna like, you know, bring in a bunch of code into your repo. You may run even more extensive tests still, perhaps, you know, every night. Um, you know, just to kind of see in the last day did anything occur, right? And so kind of based on how often this test is run, you may have, you know, a different budget for how much you can take, right? You know, if you have a nightly test that takes, you know, 48 hours to run, then perhaps maybe you might need to have a lot of servers. But, you know, maybe your nightly test takes like four hours, it's really expensive, tries a lot of things. But maybe your, you know, unit tests you run um, just on a single commit, maybe it takes, you know, 10 minutes or something. And so, but once again, this is not time you're spending there waiting as a human. No, no, no. The whole point of CI is to put this on a server someplace else in the cloud, let it do the work. Um, so types of tests you may consider. Uh, in this course, we've kind of dealt mostly with the first two, right? We dealt with unit tests, you know, you want to test that individual module, make sure uh, in, it, it makes sense in isolation. Uh, and unit tests are kind of the foundation, I guess, of any testing approach. Um, you also seen some integration tests. Perhaps you've tested individual modules in some of your homework assignments, and then you kind of put a few of those modules together to build a bigger system. That's an integration test, right? Kind of making sure you've tested those modules individually, and then you put together. And you may have also heard Jason and I when uh, giving feedback on Slack about people having challenged debugging homework problems, and they're saying, oh wait, did you unit test this module, or did you unit test this, right? That's what I was saying, you know, unit tests can be a great way to kind of narrow the scope, right? Where if you know the modules are behaving correctly, is it an issue of integration? Uh, perhaps maybe unit tests overlook something, but even still having those unit tests will help you kind of piece things apart and understand what's going on. But there are some other types of tests we didn't cover in this course because they're kind of come up from larger and more long-lived projects, but I do kind of want to briefly mention them. So one of them is this notion of a regression test, and that's kind of something where uh, it's kind of a different perspective on testing. So, so far, we've been testing things that we just wrote or just got going, we want to see it already correct. At some point in our, in our minds, we kind of accept that, you know, a certain code we believe works, and we kind of move on to something else. And so what regression testing is, is to make sure that code that we believed works still continues to work. Because it turns out, maybe a new change we made is incompatible with that older code, or perhaps the older code didn't always work, and we just overlooked something, and now it becomes apparent with some new circumstances, right? But either way, you kind of want to keep checking to make sure that things you previously thought worked still worked. And this isn't just a matter of the code as a whole. This may also be an issue of, you know, what compilers or library versions you support, or perhaps you support older versions of certain dependencies. You know, maybe on your head of master, you're constantly using newest versions of everything. Um, but then going back to the uh, older stuff, you know, you say, I support, you know, X version of this dependence. Are you actually still testing it often enough? Maybe in your daily development you aren't, but 
your regression test can you know try multiple versions they can try the little version to make sure that's still the case right and so also sometimes these regression tests you may run very large integration tests right maybe you're running a tool that does some little thing and here's this gigantic design that you know you have this collection of gigantic designs you can run through to make sure you still pass the gigantic designs and so like i said depending on when your ci is running you made different types of tests but this regression test is you know, making sure things you thought work still continue to work is kind of an important thing Additionally, you may have some very, very lightweight tests. Sometimes people refer to these as smokes tests. You know, these are designed to be very quick, um, and they're supposed to really check kind of the core critical functionality, right? And uh, you know, just because it passes the smoke test doesn't mean it's it's perfect. But if it fails the smoke test, you know, watch out, right? It's something that's you know is broken in there, and you really want to be careful about. But like I said, maybe for example, in your CI setup, you may use smoke tests on you know uh, initial things kind of coming in, and perhaps. When you're more sure it's when you want to consider more seriously, then you start running the more heavyweight tests. Um, the entire other world of testing uh, that we haven't even talked at all about is also performance testing, right? So it's one thing to get the thing correct, that's kind of what we focused on in this course. Uh, but for performance testing, you want to see, well, how fast does your thing run? Now for software, it's actually going to be very tricky to do right uh, because you want to kind of make sure you're benchmarking on system machine and you know, have all the kind of variables kind of controlled to do safe performance analysis. But you can see why it's important though. You have this large code base and you know everything continues to work correctly and then all of a sudden someone makes a code change and the thing runs 10% slower. You want to be aware of that happens, right? And so that only happens if you have performance testing kind of continuously checking this. You could do something similar for hardware design, right? Where uh, you know perhaps you have this big, uh, a large design you're working on and somebody tweaks the way they implement one of these generators for this little module, and although it's a little module, it's used many times throughout the design. And so all of a sudden now your entire design is now way over area, right? And you want to figure out what happened, right? If you have CI kind of running in the background, checking the resource features of your little module under various circumstances, it might flag a change you made early on that had certain implications, right? Perhaps someone changed something else in your design and what was you know previously not a critical path is now a, an egregious critical path, right? So having these performance tests actually is quite helpful to make sure and kind of see what's going on. And once again, it's a good thing to offload to CI. You can imagine these performance tests, especially for hardware design, where you might need to run CAD tools with you know physical design libraries and such. You don't necessarily want to do this for every single commit every time you touch something, right? But to have this kind of running in the background, making sure um, things kind of come up. That, that's something to kind of be aware of, right? You want, to be, you want to be aware of it. But like I said, the big goal for CI is just make the tools do the work. And so even this tiny little project with just maybe you working with one other partner, having a couple of tests running is kind of a good, not a good practice to learn how to set up CI, but also good for you to kind of um, keep track of things. So perhaps you'll have your own branches and you want to check things. The CI is a really nice thing to have there. So I'm going to pause for any questions or perhaps even comments of people's experiences about CI before we uh, move on. Okay, well actually, what I wanted to do next was to show you an example of CI in the wild. So if we go to the next tab, uh, this is uh, the Circle CI page linked to from uh, Chisel 3. So here we're looking at Chisel 3, a language we're using all quarter. Uh, and so this is what's happening right here. So here we're looking at the dashboard, so you can see a lot of stuff is going on here. But then you go to all the details, I just want to kind of show that, yes, you can see, you know, tests are constantly being run. These are for other things being triggered. Now you can see that these dates are a little bit old. This is because Circle CI is no longer the main mechanism they're using for this repo, but the link is still there, so I kind of used it. Um, and uh, you can see, for example, that you know there's multiple types of subtests or jobs, so to speak. And you know what? Some of these are not passing, right? For example, you know, using the older version of Scala 2.11 uh, is not passing this particular code, right? And so that's kind of a nice thing to see. And so you kind of go through. Uh, infrastructure here you can kind of see what's set up so to give you a sense of what it takes to set one of these up and this is i should emphasize an extreme super complicated case yours will be you know attempt the length of this this is the setup for actually for chisel 3 so here they're actually using the, the github action this is not the circle ci setup but you can see it's written this uh language this is actually technically yaml but it's you know some language describing stuff but for the most part you can kind of just copy paste templates you kind of describe, you know, uh, what you're doing. Maybe some branches you want to look, keep an eye on. Uh, you're telling the system um, what kind of system to run it on, and here you can start putting multiple options in there. You want to test uh, 
two versions of Scala, you want to test this old version, new version, no problem, right? Put the tools to work. You need to tell the tools how to access your code and then how to run stuff, right? And there's, there's some stuff in here where, you know, you know, public repo, we access certain resources, maybe you don't want to put certain passwords visible, so it's kind of a way to do some under table handshaking, but um, that's kind of just a brief peek. I just kind of want to show, I should circle CI interface because it's a little bit prettier. If we go look at the uh, GitHub Actions interface, we can still see it, right? So here's something that was run just two hours ago. Uh, this was run in particular for a certain things. So you can see, uh, you know, okay, well, what did this pick build? Okay, for the older version of Scala, we can go in and see how things went, were running. So we can look at, you know, okay, what was it doing? And this is not me using any special permission. This is a public repo and public CI. So, for example, if me, if I wanted to go look and see, you know, how these chisel folks ensuring this code is correct, I can invest, inspect their CI system and take a look at it and I'll look at it and see what's happening, right? And so you can see all these various things. There's a lot of little details about setting up CI to run efficiently. And those are kind of in the weeds for today, but I want you to be aware of this is a really helpful thing to set up. Uh, and it's nice and easy to run in the cloud. A lot of stuff you can just do from the browser. Uh, it's pretty cool. Um, cool. So, uh, we'll move on to the next topic then, which is code management. Um, so in this course, I didn't make a big deal about it, but we've been using Git, you know, a version control software. Um, for any kind of development, this is essential. Uh, you don't just have to use Git. There are some alternatives out there. Uh, but Git's kind of taken over as the kind of maybe the one most for open source because it's so easy kind of for everyone else to kind of work with. It's so easy for distributed and kind of peer-to-peer -peer type interactions. But the bigger picture here is by having version control, you're able to kind of track changes over time for your software. You don't need to kind of keep making files and say, you know, oh, this is that file dot backup. Oh, this is, you know, V2 or V3 or something. No, no. Put it in version control, watch things change over time, stamp things. You can have alternate versions, you know, if Git three you have branches. But also the most important part is it allows you to have collaboration where you can easily kind of synchronize and share things between people. But even if you're working solo, Git is still super helpful, right? So a few Git features you may have come across or maybe you weren't aware of until today that I kind of want to talk about to make sure you use them responsibly. So one of them actually is this notion of a submodule. What the heck is that? That's a way for you in Git to describe that this Git repo depends on another Git repo on a specific commit. Right, so you can imagine, uh, you know, uh, if I have this project I'm working on, I have this big code. Okay, it's all in one repo, but you know what? I depend on a specific version of some other code repository, added as a submodule. Right, that's a really good way of doing it. Now, as your project grows, you may find yourself wondering, oh wait, well maybe I should have multiple repos for multiple parts of my project, and then they can kind of integrate them all in together by using submodules. From personal experience, let me tell you that perhaps getting too aggressive with the submodules and two repos, that just makes your life worse, right? If you can have fewer mod repos, you'll be happier. <laughs> and so my advice is really just to only put things in separate repos if you're sure they really are completely independent or used independently. You can have things that are related, but perhaps used individually in the same repo, just because it's the same repo, same repo doesn't mean someone has to use everything that's in there, right? You can have a library in which people only use a subset functionality. That's totally fine. Um, but some models are a really handy feature for you to kind of track a specific dependence. Now, in the case of this course, you may not have realized it, but under the hood, uh, SPT, you know, has a file that tracks um, its dependencies, you know, in terms of Scala packages. And those are, you know, packaged uh, release Scala packages available on Maven, right? Or I believe Sonata type technically. Um, so those ones uh, were rotting because they're version easy to track, things like Chisel and Fertile, etc. Uh, however, maybe you have a more fast-moving project, in which case you want to depend on, on something else. Get some modules the way to go. Uh, but except for, except for your projects for this course, I recommend having just one repo. But so that thing has grown, it's kind of a question of, oh, should I kind of break things up? Maybe, but be a little cautious. There's kind of a certain overhead having more repositories. Uh, and you know, some modules are really helpful, but easy to get carried away. In the same spirit of being careful to avoid being carried away, uh, same thing goes for Git branches. Once again, really helpful for um, allowing to have multiple versions of code in the same repository. That's great. Um, you know, some of us are old enough to remember times before Git when you actually had strict rules about, okay, well, in the root level of your project, it wasn't actually the code, it was actually folders were kind of implicitly branches. Like, okay, this is, you know, the trunk versus like, you know, some other branch. And rather than being another branch, it's literally just um, 
another folder of another set of copies of the files, right? So that's, you, you can imagine it's horrible for actually trying to understand things from history. Um, so branches are really cool. Once again, you can get way too gung-ho on branches. You can have hundreds, thousands of branches. Uh, I had a repo when I was in grad school that had hundreds of branches. Would not recommend. Um, my advice for a project is to have only a few long-lived branches. Maybe you have, you know, your pretty release branch, maybe a specific version branch, maybe a development branch, maybe your main slash master branch, but you know, keep that the few rather than a lot, right? Um, now, it doesn't mean you can't have short-lived branches, right? You know, if you want to go develop a certain feature and you write up that brand, you know, fork, make a branch to go try it out and you code it up, and then later on you merge that back in, and once it's merged back in, you can delete that branch and you're done. So it's a short-lived branch. But these long-lived ones recommend some amount of caution having only a few rather than many. Um, additionally, you may hear this expression pull request or PR for short coming up sometimes. This is something that's actually not exactly a feature of Git, but it's a common feature supported by, you know, Git hosting services such as GitHub. Um, and it's kind of a way where you are requesting someone else to add your code to the repository, right? So the nice part about Git is you have this kind of distributed repo model where you have these kind of repos which are code and you have commits which kind of track different versions of the code, but you also can send the commits to different repos, right? You can share them around. And so, uh, you know, usually if you want to kind of keep Sandy in your in your repo, you don't let anybody just push to any branch. And so one nice way of doing that is this pull request model. That is where somebody says, hey, you know what? Here's a specific collection of commits I want to add to this branch on this repo. And thus the person who maintains or controls that repo and branch can look at this and decide if this is a good idea or not. And it's something you should consider doing even not just for external code, but even for internally, right? Rather than just having people kind of constantly pushing quickly to master, maybe consider being a little more judicious about it. Now, perhaps maybe in week one of your project, when you're first just trying to get things running, you may find it works good working with your partner to maybe pair program, in which case maybe the two of you is kind of pushing together onto that master branch. But, you know, perhaps maybe by the last week, when you're kind of starting to get things more polished, maybe by then it's worth considering kind of moving to this pull request model, where instead of just, you know, change a bit of stuff, you know, instead you package up kind of some clean and say, hey, I want to add this, and someone else is kind of looking over and say, is this a good idea or not? And so that review is kind of a segue for the next topic. Before I get to the reviewing, I want to kind of pause for any questions about, you know, my uh, candid advice about these good features, how to kind of use them judiciously. Okay. Uh, so that last line there is talking about this notion about giving review or reviewing something or giving feedback. So what do I mean by that? Well, um, code reviews is something that I think we don't do enough uh, academically. I originally had admissions to do it in this course, but unfortunately, uh, we quite bluntly ran out of time. So I'm gonna encourage you to do this for the project. Uh, and if this course is offered again, I will definitely be sure to squeeze it into it some course somehow. So what are code reviews? Um, it's a way of looking over your code with the help of someone else to try and make it better. And if you think about it, Imagine all the times you've written code so far, whether it be you know various course products, perhaps maybe having some personal projects, maybe even in research. Um, in some ways, it's kind of just like only a rough draft, right? You know, once you got it working uh, and it passed the test, you're like, oh man, that was a Herculean effort, and so it'd be done, and you, and you moved away, right? You moved on from there. Um, sometimes, in the back of your mind, you're like, oh well, oh, it's ugly. Oh, I'll go clean it up. And you clean it up a little bit. Um, if you try to clean it up, you know, what are you changing? How much are you really doing? And you contrast that experience from what it's like maybe writing a, an essay or a paper you really care about. It's one thing, you know, I've heard it's one to kind of forget about it, but if you're trying to write text, it's actually really good. What do you do, right? Well, you probably have an outline, brainstorm, but once you actually write the rough draft, that's only the beginning, right? You don't just stop at the rough draft. Okay, I wrote it once. It's there. It's content complete. Um, thus, you know, everything I need to say is in there. So I'm done, right? No, you don't stop there, right? You go back and you revise it and you even rewrite it uh, to improve its readability and clarity, right? And to really make it good, you don't just do this yourself. You go show other people, hey, read this. What do you think? Uh, maybe they'll find problems with your grammar. Maybe they'll find problems with the things or say, you know what? This is really confusing. I don't get X. Please explain more about Y, right? Um, these are things that perhaps are, you know, second nature when it comes to, you know, when you're trying to make really good, uh, you know, written text prose, but we don't really do the same things by default with code. But perhaps we should, at least some of the time, right? And that is to kind of think about 
what would make this better, right? And so that's where the code review comes in. Um, so code review is, you know, going through this process of trying to really analyze your code from multiple perspectives, including with the help of other people, to try and make it better, right? And so you'll be surprised what you learn from this. Uh, it's not just about, you know, uh, checkboxes. A lot of times various companies, organizations have rules about, you know, it's a mandatory amount of code reviewing, but it really helps you kind of improve things, right? So someone else, another set of eyes, uh, you know, can often find things that you overlooked, right? For example, maybe you keep using this word in a way that makes sense to you, and so the person tells you, uh, I don't think that word means what you think it means, <laughs> and it suggests that perhaps you should, you know, consider a term. Or, you know, maybe something, it's just egregious. You're like, wait, you were calling this, these like four API functions together, don't you notice there's like one API function you can call? You know, for example, even just in Scala, we learn things like, you know, there is both a dot uh, is empty and dot, you know, non-empty uh, operations, right? Uh, most languages only have one of those, right? So for example, you may not be aware that you might have a you know, negation on one of those, not realizing you could use the other one. Just, for example, someone maybe in a code review help you find, right? And what's nice about these code reviews is that they help you find things beyond just getting your code right the first time. And this is kind of a really important thing about developing uh, your skill, right? Because um, if your code returns the wrong answer, you know it's the wrong answer, right? At least hopefully you know it's the wrong answer. Sometimes maybe you don't, but let's say you know it's the wrong answer. Well, shoot, you're going to go try and fix your code to get the right answer out of it. But let's say you're doing something that's, you know, just not good, but your code behaves correctly. How do you know it's not good? Code reviews are a great way to deal with that. Um, and the reason why is it helps in both directions, right? On the one hand, it's almost like your code can be like, Yo, that's that's a problem. You need to like deal with this, right? They can suggest this. You get another way to kind of learn tips and tricks, conventions for a certain language, and how to better express that. At the same time, even if people aren't reading your code, if you're reading their code, you may see certain things like, oh, that's an interesting way of writing this API, or hmm, that's an interesting way of kind of structuring this. And so you'd be amazed how you go through a code review process, which maybe some of you have already gone through. Often maybe people's first code review process is actually like a summer internship in industry or something and getting just the equivalent of their entire code marked up, right? And there's tons of red ink equivalently. Um, but it's good, right? You kind of realize, oh wait, even though I had correct code, how can I make this cleaner, better, under all sorts of different types of metrics, right? Um, additionally, the, the even just the fear of code review uh, can help make your code better, not just because you're putting effort into it, but also forcing you to think about how would my code look to someone else? And how can I make my code, you know, more accessible, more appealing to someone else, right? And so um, this is a really valuable thing and I would strongly recommend you do this for your project, right? Uh, I was on the fence about requiring this for a project and then I decided, you know what? I'm gonna have fewer written requirements for these final few assignments, but I really, really, really recommend you folks do a code review, right? And even if it's your first time for both parties involved and you aren't sure what to do, give it a try. Right, so perhaps maybe you're going to pair a program as two of you going to write the same code at the same time for much of your project. For sake of trying it out, maybe try allocating the two of you different portions of the project. Um, you know, I'm going to write this portion, you're going to write that portion, just for a while. This is be the entire project, just little portions. Write those things in isolation. Try your best to polish them in isolation, and then send them to the other person for review and see what they find. Right, and like I said, for these reviews. You're just trying to find something that's like flagrantly wrong. Just something like, you know what? I might find this kind of naming more clear. You know what? Uh, perhaps we should, you know, adopt a consistent, you know, terminology or conventions on how we name things in this project or how we uh, address certain things and we can, we can do that, right? So it leads to good conversations. So code review, although maybe sounds kind of boring or intimidating, um, really helps me become a better programmer as well as improving your code. So it's like, it's, it's, a, it's kind of really a win-win in that sense. Cool. Um, I actually have one more slide on code reviews, I think. Yes. So what's the process, right? So you kind of maybe intuitive the process, maybe more explicit. First, someone asks for a code review, right? And so sometimes uh, this isn't something you do intentionally. You just, you know, try to, you know, open a pull request like that. And for a certain project, it may require, you know, a review approval in order to actually get accepted. The reviewer looks over the code, makes suggestions, requests. Typically, there's software they can use to directly annotate the code saying, you know what, they can mark the line they're talking about, they can mark the things they're worried about. Also realize that this code review software uh, may also include things like CI results, right? So that person has been asked to do a code review, they're going to see your code, they're going to see particularly the changes you made relative to prior versions of code typically, 
they're also going to see the CI results, right? So they're probably going to want to see all green checks on the CI before they even look at the code. And otherwise, they're probably going to turn around to you right away and say, you know what? Fix the CI issues first. Now, sometimes maybe your CI is a little bit broken, in which case, you know, sometimes there's a CI error, you know, is not really an error. It's like a false positive. I recommend trying to keep those happening very rarely. <laughs> but anyway, so you can imagine this process. Okay, so you send the code for review. Some other human looks at it and makes some suggestions. And then they send it back. And then the submitter makes revisions and sends it back to the review. And maybe this is multiple rounds. Um, and eventually, at some point, the reviewer says, okay, I approve, right? Uh, or the most common um, uh, shorthand for this is LGTM, or looks good to me. Um, but you can see this kind of process, right? Where you know, submitted code for review, you went back and forth. It's pretty common that they usually find at least something. That it's not just about correctness. It's also about... You know, this is unclear, this is not following our conventions, this is et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so it's also the reasons why they may kind of be thinking about that. Okay, and so then what should you actually do in these code reviews? Typically organizations have like a checklist. Okay, make sure reviews, you know, pass the following. But in light, in, in spite of that, I kind of give you some of the things I kind of look at, right? So what are you looking for? Number one, correctness, right? Hopefully your CI catches a lot of that, right? But as a human who's hopefully knowledgeable of this code, that's why you're being assigned to review it, you may know about certain things to be wary of, right? You say, you know what, even though you're doing this thing, that API you're depending on, maybe, you know, are you sure it'll handle this case? What about this other corner case? Use your knowledge of this code to help try and figure out what other scenarios or consider. Um, there are these readability code style kind of concerns about, you know, are you following the conventions of our group? Um, could you maybe make this code cleaner or Etc. You know, for example, maybe there's some Scala feature you're unaware of, or some other API that exists you're unaware of. When it comes to some of these style issues, you can use tools like Scala Style that will analyze your code for certain types of mistakes automatically, right? So, for example, if you maybe if you saw, you know, um, IntelliJ making some some suggestions in some cases about your code, uh, sometimes it's being powered by something like Scala Style. Um, and some of these, of course, also come from humans. When it comes to style. This is one of the things that's really important for a large project I don't think really teach enough in courses, and that is teaching programmers how to kind of be selfless, right? Where uh, the last thing you want to have is a shared code base where someone could open a code file and scroll to a random part of the code and be like, and so looking at the code, be like, oh my gosh, yeah, this is, you know, so-and-so's work. You don't want to be known for that, right? You want, <laughs> instead, to not have distinctive coding style, instead, adopt the group coding style. So whatever set of variable naming, choices of API features using, white space, et cetera, do it in a way that's consistent across the entire project. And thus, you shouldn't know, other than looking at version control, who made a certain file. It's a good goal to have, and it's actually quite doable if you're willing to kind of be selfless, right? Say, you know, I'm the right code, not this, you know, I think it's brilliant. I don't want somebody looking at my code and be like, oh my gosh, this is so cleverly written. That's the last thing you want. You want somebody looking at your code and be like, don't even think about the way you wrote it and just understand what you did and move on, right? You want to be very clear, very readable. Um, and also kind of is faceless, right? Kind of, you know, sense of, you know, it blends into the rest of the code. It's no different than the rest of the code by style or way it's written. So that's what it is. Let's be clear, right? If you write code that's impenetrable and dense and everyone knows it's your code, they're going to keep calling on you, right? They're going to keep bugging you to fix it. And you're not going to be popular with your colleagues, right? So really kind of adopt this selfless notion of in the build code kind of according to this group convention. It's going to blend in. And it's going to be very clear and easy to work with. And so these these code reviews are what we kind of encouraged at, right? So you know what? Hey, we as a group agreed this is our style. This is our, you know, thing, and you're not following our, our style conventions. So I can help with that. Um, additionally, it's all kind of completeness, right? Sometimes it's kind of a checkbox. Sometimes it's worth kind of taking more seriously, right? You know, hey, you added new functionality to the code. Uh, did you add tests for that? Or you know what? You fixed a bug in the code. That's great. But, you know, do you have tests that, you know, show that bug in the old code and now show that your new code fixes it, that would be great. Or are you adding documentation sufficient to what you're doing? Or perhaps what you've done has changed some functionality. Have you changed the documentation? These are also things to consider. Um, like I said, this is just kind of like a high level overview of the kind of things you might consider. Like I said, usually organizations have some sort of checklist for this process. Um, but these are the kind of things you might consider. And these are also maybe not bad to consider when you're trying to review your colleagues' work for your project. Um, now, sometimes there's some very long-term big issues that come up for, you know, big organizations where it's like, you know what, you're adding really cool functionality or something, or a really cool feature, but 
is this something we as an organization or project actually want to get involved in? Or maybe it's something you're afraid to deal with or your worries and cause more bugs. Like maybe someone has support for a new AP, uh, interface on your code, but oh my gosh, I don't want to support that community. So sometimes there's other factors that come up, right, when looking at the code. But kind of the whole point of a code review is to kind of have some sanity and process of looking at what you're doing, right? So already here, we've kind of covered a few um, things here. We talked about, okay, you want to set up CI to kind of constantly check things. You don't want to just take code and merge it right in automatically. You said you want to kind of stage it in these pull requests, look at it first, and think about if you want to accept this code or not. And then when you're doing that pull, re pull request, you should do a code review and kind of make sure this is something you should actually take. Um, and kind of go through, maybe you, even if you are going to take it, you still may want to revise it, kind of iteratively improve that code before you actually fully accept it. Okay, maybe pause here for any questions or comments on this. Okay, I believe I have more tabs. Uh, and so uh, here I am digging through this public repo chisel, which we've been using all quarter, and I found a recently closed uh, pull request. So uh, what do we have here? Uh, so someone um, was dealing with a bug and they were trying to fix it, right? So um, what's all this other stuff here? There's ways in GitHub to give a template that kind of uh, has a form for people to kind of fill in, so that way people can kind of can very quickly convey to the uh, repo organizers or maintainers, um, you know, what they need to do. But okay, so they had this suggestion, uh, and so you can see it had a couple commits, right? So these commits, they were you know saying I want to change these things, a couple small tweaks to some files, not too big. Um, so what happens? All right, well this pull request was made, and then the tools ran some stuff, right? So there's like multiple types of tools running in this case. So we have, you know, the GitHub action CI. So it, you know, ran some tests, like we saw before, we can kind of see, you know, what's actually uh, running. You can see, oops, there's some, looks like some compiler warnings here actually, but if we scroll down, uh, we'll see some tests passing hopefully. Um, and so, okay, it passed the test. We see some green checks, that's good. Um, this thing helps you with the, merging into pull requests. Then going back to the conversation, let's go back to that tab. Okay, great, so you can see uh, this person submitted it and then um, there it was some comments. Okay, well, what is this doing here? And so this person is kind of annotating their own code, explaining what they did. Uh, and you can kind of see they were talking about it. Uh, there's some feedback from some other reviewers and there was some tweaks and some changes, some discussion, and then finally there's the happiest words you want to hear, you know, it's approved, right? So they were approved, <laughs> looks good to me, uh, and then, you know, eventually it got merged. So this, this is kind of that, that's kind of an example of this lifecycle playing out. Cool, I think that's a good amount for that example. Great, um, so we'll move on to the next topic then. So documentation. Um, it's really important actually, even though it's not super exciting. Hopefully you can kind of see from this course where I'm kind of trying to encourage kind of a more long-term uh, perspective when you think about your code and your projects. Um, and documentation is one of those things I think people overlook, and it's actually, I would say, the most common reason why a certain code that's perhaps really neat uh, does not take off open source. Um, and it's kind of multiple things you need to do for documentation to get it right. Um, number one, this is sounds easier than it actually is, uh, summarizing what the freaking project does. I can't tell if I come across uh, something on GitHub or something, and I spend five minutes trying to figure out what does it actually do? <laughs> Don't make that your project, right? Sometimes you'll see, for example, on the summary byline on GitHub, you know, there's some acronym name for the project, and then the description byline says the repo for the, you know, insert acronym name here, project. And it's like, what does that tell me to do? And you scroll down to the readme, and the readme tells you, here are the dependencies we depend on. And it's like, what are you actually doing? Um, so very clearly, summarize what the project does. There's, there's a little bit of tact to this in terms of using appropriate jargon to convey quickly to experts what you're doing, as well as have just enough non-jargon terms in there for people who are perhaps maybe not experts in that topic or maybe only experts in related topics to kind of get a sense of what's going on. Um, number one, people should walk away with an understanding, or at least they try reading your things to understand what the heck does your project do. Obviously, it should be instructions on how to use it. 
And then, of course, there's the details about the internal structure and functionality. And I broke up in these three different levels because um, understand that that's there's, there's a relation here often how, how for how much text there is versus how much people read it, right? So many many people are going to see your project as be passed around on GitHub or see something listed on a web page or search results. And so being able to briefly and succinctly, perhaps even just a few words in your byline, summarize what your project does, that's really important because a lot of people are going to see that. Then your users are probably also going to want to instruct us how to use it. Not everybody sees the search results, it's actually going to become a user, but still a large number of people. The people that actually read all of your code and interact with it on a deep, on a deep level, uh, and really care about details, that's like the minority, right? So in terms of the volume of text, it's inversely related, right? The, the details is the most text to document. So people often think of that and they get really intimidated and they get so intimidated about doing that or get so unenthused about doing that, they overlook the first two and realize the first two are read by more people and are much less text. So I would at least do number one, make sure people understand what this code does. <laughs> and then perhaps at least, you know, number two, he's not too much work how to set it up and how to run it. And then the internal details, that'd be good, but that's maybe not as critical. I said, lack of documentation really harms you in multiple ways. It's not just a matter of getting adopted by others in the wider community, but even internally, trying to have contributors, right? And or, or even as collaborators within your organization. If someone else doesn't know how your code works, um, it's hard for them to work with it, right? And maybe you find yourself constantly answering questions about your code. That may be an indication that you've not documented your code well enough, right? And if you document your code better, perhaps people can read documentation and ask you fewer questions, right? So lack of documentation really kind of harms potential users and contributors is really kind of a big thing. Um, so having good documentation, by contrast, you know, encourages users, encourages contributors, also kind of forces you to think about what you've done and what other people kind of see maybe might rethink your interfaces. Um, when it comes to actually writing documentation, the readme file is like the bare minimum. Like I said, first sense, what does it do? Um, and you know what, for many projects, the readme file is really all you need. Uh, you can kind of put a little bit of everything in there and it's really easy to maintain, just a single file, right? That's kind of how we described our homework queue, for example. Um, if you use Markdown, uh, GitHub even automatically renders it kind of pretty, so you can kind of make it look not too bad, without too much effort. So yeah, readme is like the bare minimum. Um, one step beyond that is something like uh, ScalaDoc, you know, where you can kind of put these uh, special comments in your code. So you have special annotations and special things in the comments. And then, of course, the tool, the ScalaDoc tool, will generate pretty HTML. Um, so you have these pretty uh, API web pages. And um, a few nice things about ScalaDoc, in addition to having kind of very nice documentation, it's kind of all web-based, you can kind of easily click around with hyperlinks. Um, the docs are mixed with the code. So it's easier to kind of keep things in sync. You don't have two separate repositories worrying about them getting out of sync. No, no, they're in line, they're together. So hopefully, you know, in your code review process, someone changes code in a way that impacts the nearby documentation. They'll flag and hey, you didn't change docs too, you gotta change the docs too, and they'll fix that, right? Um, by contrast, sometimes if you want like a full on static site, right? Um, like a static website, right? And so read a docs is one place to consider hosting this kind of stuff, but that's just a quick example. Um, and the static site stuff is really kind of nice to kind of just get things out there. The course homepage for this course is actually is kind of using the same static site stuff you use to document a project. Um, it's really easy for us as staff to kind of just check together some stuff. And these static site generators now are really easy to kind of produce content for. You just download a template, write some markdown, boom, you're done. Um, and so you've actually seen both these kinds of docs within that same triple product. It's kind of why I'm showing you this project from multiple angles, right? So. Uh, you know, maybe you recognize uh, this page. That's you know the, the Scala doc generate information about the API. So you're looking at, for example, the Chisel Utils Arbiter, and you know, okay, yes, we can see all the details about the stuff. But now what it was worth looking at is how it's actually look inside the code. Uh, well, here is you know the Scala file for the code, and um, you can see, okay, uh, we're familiar with Scala, of course, but then. Um, you can start seeing some of the annotations, right? So this kind of stuff isn't just a random Scala comment. It has the right uh, details to actually be picked up by the Scala.compiler. It's gonna go ahead and, you know, recognize these various segments and turn those into the documentation you see here. And the Scala doc tool is smart enough to recognize, even though your code may have a certain, you know, hierarchy, it knows how to kind of group things according to the package hierarchy, for example, automatically. So that's pretty cool. Um, Additionally, in this course, you've also benefited from these kind of nice explanations uh, written by a Chisel developers, kind of explaining certain features, kind of this kind of nice 
which is a way rather than focusing on exact API details, you kind of get to see a nice mix of, you know, uh, examples and some supporting text and kind of covering the, the broad strokes rather than focusing on the uh, tiny details. So for example, you know, here's um, the page on Chisel data types. If you go looking inside the Chisel repo, you can see inside the docs directory, this is where that comes from, you know, under the source for explanations. Uh, so now here is GitHub rendering that markdown for us. So it already looks kind of pretty nice right now. If instead we were, you know, for example, to, uh, you know, look at the raw text, you know, this is markdown. It's a way to uh, write this up. So you can see this is not super impossible to write um, and you get that pretty thing. So yeah, it's kind of wanted to show uh, a couple of examples of things we kind of done this already in this course. And yeah, you can kind of see these things at work. And there's, there's many other ways to document things. There's ways to generate PDF docs or other things. I just kind of want to give a shout out to these kind of tools that maybe you've already been using and maybe didn't even realize. Cool. Questions on this? Okay, well then, uh, kind of closing out my advice on documentation of a few writing tips. It's kind of something I've seen over my years looking at other people's code and documentation. Um, and so I, you can see the same advice being repeated again here because I think it's so commonly overlooked. Where one, give a brief summary of what the overall function or purpose of what your code is. And I think the purpose is sometimes the one that's lost in some of these documentations where they give a very concrete description of what its functionality is and you're like, what the heck is that for? And so maybe if you can't somehow briefly convey what the application or these application scenarios are, it's something that's kind of worth doing. Um, some more kind of, you know, platitudes about things to aspire to in documentation writing. Um, emphasize the purpose of something over how it works internally. People get really obsessed about, oh, I have this object, which is detected to this object, and implemented with this object. Your users don't care. They care about what it's for and what it does, right? <laughs> um, Additionally, I kind of emphasize the interaction uh, of how to work with something. Uh, once again, a lot of times developers really get obsessed with trying to explain, well, here you need to appreciate this abstraction, then you need to appreciate this abstraction, then you need to appreciate this abstraction. And it's like, no, I, I don't want to learn five abstractions. I just want something that works, right? And so you can find yourself trying to introduce a lot of abstractions. Once again, maybe it's an uh, indication for you that perhaps you need something really confusing. And maybe you should think about making your interface simpler and kind of imagining what are user scenarios actually like in Maybe you just use scenarios you kind of can refinance, uh, you know, refactor your interfaces to make it easier for them to kind of just get what they want right away. Find to learn about all these abstractions, right? So someone tells you you need to, you know, subclass this thing, instantiate this other object, and then subclass this other object in order to get something going. And it's like, I just want a library call, right? I don't care about these other things, right? And so, um, yeah, so think about that. Cool. Okay. Well, if there's no more questions on our comments and documentation. I'll keep going. Um, so uh, last but not least is the actual open sourcing, right? Um, so there's a lot of research open source. This is just a handful of ones that came up in the last few days. Um, number one is you're helping the world, right? If you made something, that's cool. Um, and the reason why you wouldn't be happy to have other people benefit from that, right? That would be good to kind of get out there, especially as researchers that are often funded with public tax dollars. Um, it's good to kind of make the world better and put stuff out there. Interestingly, even if you're at a company, um, you often be surprised how sometimes you can open source your work. And it's actually not just going to benefit you or the company, benefit both you or the company, right? And so, and this is not just, you know, me saying that, but this happens a lot even already, right? So for example, now it's probably nearly 10 years ago, but, you know, for Facebook launched something called the Open Compute Project, where they released a lot of details of how the data center uh, was built, right? And how the computers they wanted for the data center. You might be saying, wait, that's completely opposite of the mentality at that time. At that time, all their competitors were very telling about the data center details. And Facebook did this because they recognized, you know what? Our advantage isn't our ability to build a data center. Our advantage is the data they had, right? So conversation about the data and what they're using it for is a whole other thing, but they knew that their advantage was their data. And so all they cared about was reducing the costs of their data center. And so by putting their stuff out there, they allowed the community to contribute to it, perhaps even reduce their costs by adopting it, right? And so What's interesting is that kind of this huge shift across the landscape, where even though they were open sourcing their stuff, other companies eventually started becoming less secretive because guess what? This stuff was already kind of out there from Facebook. Um, and it kind of had this huge, you know, transitional shift for the, for the entire field, right? And so case of out there helps. And in the long run for many things in computing, a lot of the most adopted, most used things really are open source, right? Things like Linux or GCC or Clang, right? These are all huge stars of open source, right? 
Um, and so what's good about things open source? It's not just about you sharing with other people, they also can share back, right? A community can improve your code, right? And you can do these amazing things like Linux or Clang that are far too large for any organization to produce and they're used by a lot of people and they're really amazing, right? And so you'd be surprised how even for very small code things you put online, people still send contributions and they can add functionality, fix bugs, improve performance. I've had cases where I put code online and yeah, out of nowhere, someone finds a bug I didn't even know was there and sends me a fix. And it's like, that's great. This is nice. <laughs> this is good. Like, I'm glad that you fixed the code. I'm glad that people who use this code also can benefit from it, right? So that's good. Um, if these altruistic things don't uh, motivate you, perhaps more and more, you know, uh, selfish reasons might motivate you. So open sourcing that's successful can really raise your profile. People will be more aware of you, right? People um, can see your contributions. You know, if you work for a company all day and all of your contributions are kind of internal, maybe people outside the organization don't know what you do, but with open source, maybe they can. They can see the impact of what you're doing. Um, and lastly, it's kind of a why not attitude, right? Uh, even if you're using proprietary OS and proprietary hardware, some part of your development tool flow is open source, right? I so rarely see somebody use somebody's completely proprietary code anymore, right? And so you already benefit from open source, and so you might as well give back. And so ask yourself, is there, you know, a restriction from my organization, a business, or a pad reason why I can't, you know, release this? If there is, maybe you can't. But if not, why not release it, right? Okay, so uh, if you're going to release an open source project, there's kind of two things you need to do. Number one, to actually be successful and used, right? Uh, needs to be useful, needs to be correct, needs to be well documented. Um, this one's a little hard to kind of do, but sometimes you need a little publicity to kind of get the word out. But the last details, that one right there, is it needs to be available from open source license, right? So I'm going to kind of briefly summarize open source licensing. Perhaps you may be familiar with this and you may have strong opinions about this, but I just kind of want to give a brief overview for everyone. Um, so interestingly, if you just create something, hopefully novel, and code, uh, you don't get the copyright for it. You don't need to go apply to copyright office. You actually already get the copyright for it. That's, that's your code. Um, and because of that copyright, there's actually restrictions on what other people can do with it. Anybody just chuck this code online doesn't mean it's just a free-for-all. Uh, that copyright's still there. However, um, there's, some, there's some caveats to this, right? Number one, uh, if you create something in the scope of your employment, your employer probably gets the copyright, or at least some fraction of the copyright. Uh, you know, somewhere deep in your uh, pipe work you signed when you were hired. This even goes for grad students when you were hired as a graduate student researchers. This is just some sort of, you know, release you're signing for your intellectual property, etc. And you're kind of agreeing that, hey, things I do in my employment, the employer gets a share of. But other than that, you know, if you make something, usually it's your copyright. Okay, so as a result, someone else kind of can't really use it because you have to copyright for it. So in order for someone else to use it, you need to give them a license to give them permission to do certain things. And so that's what license does. It licenses, you know, hey, you can use this thing for these purposes with these caveats and restrictions, right? And for open source software, you need to have a license in order to give people permission to do certain things. And license defines exactly what those things are. And so there's a lot of open source licenses out there, all sorts of bells and wrinkles and wrinkles. There's lots of things that are intended by licenses. There's things that are kind of outcomes of case law from prior litigation. Um, I'm going to kind of gloss over a lot and just kind of say that there's some high level things you have to be aware of for given license, right? Um, number one, does license allow you to use it for commercial purposes? Arguably anything that we want to open source without just some sort of disclosure should allow you to use it for commercial purposes, but that's not guaranteed, right? Someone has a copyright for it, they, they have that thing until they, you know, release that. Um, the most controversial one is this notion about distributing changes, right? If you modify the code as open sourced uh, and you use it, are you required to share those changes? Or if you use this project as part of a larger project, um, how does that impact your larger project's license stance? So there's this notion of copy left versus permissive. So a permissive license, um, these are very broad terms uh, with some nuanced exact instances. Uh, permissive license allows people to say, you know what? You change it, maybe you don't need to share changes. Or you know what, if you want to use a larger project, your larger project can kind of define its own license rules. Some projects are very determined to have everything be open source and proper, in which case it's copy left, meaning that uh, if you change it, you need to share the changes. And if you have a bigger project, your bigger project needs to maintain the same licensing as the thing you're including. Um, as I said, this is the most controversial, most contentious one. Um, in terms of other things you might consider about features of a license, things like, uh, are you allowed to use certain trademarks? Um, 
for branding. For example, maybe some prestigious institution made their code originally and you know, you're modifying that code. Uh, are there rules about your ability to use the prestige of the trademark for the code or the creator to in your stuff? Usually they don't let you do that. Um, and then finally, it's another one which comes up much more often more recently, and that is even though you maybe have given somebody the ability to use the code, that code may internally have a certain process that's patented, right? And so if someone, even if you give permission to use your code, and they have the you know the exemptions to that copyright law, they may not be exempt from the patent constraints in that code. And so thus the license may also need to give a patent grant and say, you know what, if you use this code in the manner which we allow, you also are allowed to use these patents that includes in this manner we allow. Um, so it's kind of a high level summary. There's a lot more features. I said these documents as a whole bunch. You can have entire courses on this material, but quick summary for today. Um, so the license you'll see out there, uh, BSC and MIT are the most common you might see, right? And these are especially common for academic projects. They're permissive. Um, there's actually multiple flavors of BSD even, but you know, two or three clause BSD is quite common. Uh, basically says, hey, put this out there. I'm giving it out. You can use it. You can even sell this stuff with it. Um, you're not required to share changes, right? Uh, GPL, like I said, that one is more restrictive, is copy left, so it's more restrictive, right? So, hey, if you use GPL code, especially version three, you're required to, you know, release certain things. This is the use of things like Linux, so it's a big deal. We realize that sometimes companies are actually have explicit policy preventing their employees from using this because that requirement about being uh, required to redistribute it or have some licenses on any derivatives of it is a real, um, uh, you know, stopper for some companies, right? So for that reason, companies are often usually much happier with code that's BSD or MIT as opposed to GPL. But maybe you are really convinced that your code needs to be open source always, in which case you're committed to GPL. Um, sometimes people talk about Apache, especially Apache version two. It's a permissive license like the BSD ones, but it includes this patent grant. So it says, hey, you know what? If I lose this license, uh, Interscope using this, you know, code according to this license, I'm also allowed to use any patents contained within uh, as approved by the patent holder, who's also the same thing. So large companies love to see this, right? Because they're afraid that they adopt some open source code, even though they're using it legally according to the license, they may inadvertently get pulled into something where they're using something as a patented process and they get sued for violating that patent by license for that patent. The patent grant kind of makes them feel a lot better about that. Um, and then uh, finally, there's some extremely permissive licenses that are because you're just trying to give the code away. You're saying, you know what? I know I have the copyright by default, but I'm just trying to give it away. These are things like the unlicensed or do whatever the F you want uh, public license, right? Which is trying to give it away. Um, and so when it comes to the licenses, you know, where should you put these? You can go ahead and pick one. You can kind of make an informed decision about what your features make sense to you. Uh, put it somewhere prominent, you know, like a license file in your root directory. And places like GitHub will automatically try and search and detect the licenses used. Sometimes you got to kind of nudge it along. Um, there's even now this new format called the SPDX uh, thing. It's kind of a way to mod mark your files so hopefully that both humans and computers can kind of quickly recognize what's there. Um, so going back to this uh, set of examples I have using Chisel 3, if you go to Chisel 3 repo itself, you can see GitHub uh, recognize this as Apache V2 uh, right there, right? So it's kind of there. You click on this link, takes you to that license file, and here's GitHub summary of it, which kind of tells you what it can do. Um, you know, here, for example, you know, you can't use a trademark you're saying, you know. Um, and, you know, of course, here's the actual legalese. Um, and then let's look back around. Yeah, so that's kind of a very brief summary of licensing. Um, kind of like many things that involve legal matters in your personal life, you may find that uh, for important things, it probably is worth reaching out to professionals, right? So here on campus, uh, you know, there is a, uh, you know, uh, patent uh, an IP office for Santa Cruz. And there's also one broader for UC. So for example, for really big important things, maybe you should reach out to them. But you don't necessarily need to involve them in every last little thing you do, just the same as, you know, uh, you don't maybe call a lawyer every time you need to sign a new um, app update on your smartphone because you need to accept the license agreement. So kind of, you know, for yourself, kind of maybe do a, a risk uh, probability of damage an assessment based on that determine if you need to bring professionals. But sometimes you do. This is confusing. Uh, it's worth bringing them in sometimes. Um, Cool. Okay, sorry, let's advance the slides. And so yeah, we kind of already talked about this, right? What does it take to make your project successful? In terms of actually attracting contributions, um, these are often overlooked. People kind of say, put the code online, nobody used it, nobody helped, why, right? Here's the things to consider. Make it interesting and useful, right? Sometimes it's very niche, right? Uh, testing is really important, right? Uh, testing is important for them to realize they didn't break it and also for them to convince themselves that it works. 
Documentation, once again, huge hurdles. The most common reason why code is just abandoned as opposed to actually used. Documentation. Documentation and testing are both the kind of key things, right? Also important is responsiveness to the community, right? Uh, if I go to your GitHub organization repo and I see you have, you know, issues from two months ago filed by somebody asking a question that seemed pretty reasonable, you didn't respond to it, that doesn't look good, right? You should actually address these. Um, and maybe there's resources you can kind of help build a community for, right? You know, maybe you have like a mailing list or a Gitter is kind of a chat switch of a repo or a Stack Overflow tag or something. Um, another way you can help is actually have explicit suggestions on things people can do. Uh, you'd be surprised if somebody likes your repo, gets really excited about it, and you tell them, hey, something that can be done, and they go off and go do it. Um, so that's kind of pretty cool. So, wrapping up today, uh, hopefully you saw a kind of variety of developer skills that are relevant, and I'm hoping, you know, you're going to go try something on your project, right? In particular, you're going to go maybe try and set some CI to make sure you're kind of not breaking anything on your project. Maybe you'll do a code review with you and your partner. It's one of all things on this list today. It's the one that's the most important to me. So you should do a code review with you and your partner, not just pair program, but actually go through that process of giving feedback and getting feedback. Document what you've done, which you're going to need to do for this course anyways. Um, and then we hope to encourage you to open source what you've done, right? Um, and release uh, your, your project. And with that, uh, we're done. I'll take any final questions. Okay, I believe that is time. Uh, have a good day, folks.